Pontia City Expats Club is a non-profit social organisation and our speakers are volunteers. The club as such assumes no responsibility or liability for the professional reputation of or the quality of services provided by the speaker today. Anyway, Ren, you're heading for another certificate. Was that right? You had another damp patch on the wall you wanted to cover up. I can't talk about my damp patches. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it all depends where they are, of course. Okay, give our Ren, our own man, a I've never thought I'd ever be introduced on the back of references to damp patches. <laughs> uh, um, firstly, Marjorie, hi. Wow. Marjorie. Our oldest member is like 93 now, is it? Yes. Wow, welcome Marjorie. It's wonderful to see you again. It's been a while. Uh, so, also before I start the actual talk, I'd like to say a few words about the bias in Australia. When I was 27, I wrote an outline of a miniseries. The miniseries was a big thing. It was called Firestorm. And the opening scenes were really about this fire chief who had put this proposal to the Premier, Governor of the state, about systematically burning off the bush. But as he leaves, he realises that there's greenies in the waiting office and he sees a look on the premier's face and he knows that they're going to go with the greenies. Australian bush is designed to burn. It's always burnt. From before man was ever set foot on the continent, there were massive fires raging across Australia from lightning strikes. Wattle trees will not germinate unless there's been bushfire. The only question is, is it going to burn in control, which is what the fireys wanted and been saying for decades, or is it going to burn out of control, which is the legacy of Green saying, oh no, it's too precious to burn, and we need governments listening to it. I just wish there was some list that could be made of we need governments who are caved into Greens, because this is the legacy of their decisions over the decades. Deep breath. <sighs> Understanding Thailand part two. One thing I've learned about Thailand is your speakers could drop out at five o'clock on Friday. <laughs> now, I've had a very, very valid reason. we booked in again for the 26th of the month. <laughs> Who was not here for the talk I gave on Understanding Thailand a few weeks ago? Who was not here? Who actually caught it on YouTube later, right? It's actually had a record number of views for a talk at the expat clubs, like over 250 views. So I do recommend you watching it. <coughs> now, it starts off, it's called Understanding Thailand and why it's changed so much so quickly. Now, one of the case I made that I'm sure is correct is that the primary driver of change in Thailand has been plunging birth rate. Unbelievably exponential change in the birth rate. So you can see there, the uh, Philippines has gone down steadily, Japan has been, and Thailand has plunged. And one of the manifestations of this is that, for instance, when I came here, say, 2005, uh, and the birth rate going back 25 years was 3.39 children per woman. But 25 years ago today, the birth rate had dropped to 1.87 children per woman. That's in the space of 15 years of it halved. Now that means if they'd stayed at the same birth rate, there would now be twice as many 25 year olds in Thailand. So you want to know what the primary driver of change in Thailand is demographics. Now, I was talking about this to a very dear friend of mine that I made when I was living in Bangkok. We met at an art show and it turned out we went to the same primary school in Australia to go to public school in different years. And he teaches at university. And one of the, one of the, and he said, oh yeah, this demographic change, Thai universities now are struggling to fill their classes, meet their quotas and stuff, because 
there's just so much less people in that age group to go to university. And by the way, if anybody ever says to you about some major change, you've always got to be thinking, well, could demographic change be behind this? Uh, for instance, there's oh, some book about how we become, how certain countries have become less violent. But part of the reason that is the plunging number of young people. See, most violent acts tend to be committed by people in their late teens and their twenties. So you think, oh, we become less violent? No, we've just got less young people, right? Now, so what do you think if this massive demographic change is the major driver of change in Thailand? What's the second biggest driver of change in Thailand? What do you think? Call, call something out. Tourists. Income. 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 <laughs> Consumer credit. Oh, yes. The availability of credit. Also for companies, yes, so they can build these massive buildings they shouldn't be building. Oh, we have all these pre-sales. Don't know what that's going to end up in. But consumer credit, household debt. This is why are there so many cars on the road? Car loans. How how much has been driven by the number of cars on the road, all the infrastructure and stuff? Massive change. So this gives you an idea of the exponential growth. Now, the standard way to measure growth in household debt is against gross domestic product, GDP, right? So obviously Thailand's GDP has gone massively up, but even against that massively rising GDP, the percentage of the household debt against that has risen exponentially. And you can see this here. Here's Thailand's 12th on the largest Debt, uh, highest um, household debt to gross domestic product. But look at this. 2005, it was 45% of gross domestic product. And now, in the space of like 10, year, 10 years, it's gone up to 80%. <coughs> that is amazing. Now, this, this chart's a little bit confusing, but it, it actually covers five recent years. And you can see here, this is property. And the percentage has tended to drop. Uh, credit cards have stayed about the same. Personal loans have gone down and up. But look at this. Auto loans. 2014, there was like no auto loans. And now it's like the biggest aspect of, of household debt is auto loans. You think this Thai government's not starting to sweat a bit about this? 1,300 factories closed last year. Right? Now, all those people are going to be defaulting on their household, that lost their jobs, they're probably going to be defaulting on their auto loans. So this is one of the biggest worries about a major downturn in the industry. And Yingla, when she was, she had a scheme to encourage auto purchases, uh, was a tax deduction. They could get tax credits for auto purchases. And of course, the, the, the automobiles are produced here, so it creates jobs and big industry likes it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, just hope it's not a house of cards. And also remember, you know, the two ways that people were traditionally enslaved in the past, became slaves, one, of course, through war and conquest, and secondly, through debts they couldn't meet, right? That's how, oh, well, I can't meet my debt, take, take you as my son as your slave, right? Uh, and this, 10 years ago, I met this woman, and uh, I had a friend fell in love with her and stuff, and she, the parents in his son couldn't make their payments on their truck, so they she didn't want to go. They sort of like push you to come down here and join the industry here. So it worked out well because he was stupid for rain and built a house, and she met somebody else and married him in Switzerland. But when when she came back here, she'd still sleep with my friend. <laughs> and of course, th this consumer, this whole thing about uh, this consumer credit, is that that makes possible this terrible over. Car, you know, the McMansions of cars. These ridiculously large cars that they really have no use for. That, you know, four wheel drives that will never see a dirt road, right? And the other thing, of course, is like, I've never bought a new car in my life. You drive them out of a lot, and they've like dropped by some ridiculous percentage of what they're worth. Now, this is another factor that drives consumer behaviour in Thailand. Thais. Almost all Thais believe in ghosts. 
right? These are not a fictional, these are a reality. And this is one particular ghost, type of ghost, PM. So I say that right, Sally? PM? PM? Anyway, never mind. So, um, whoever here has ever experienced sleep paralysis? This is where you wake up and you can feel your body in the bed, you feel a bed underneath you, but you can't move your body. Right? I've, I've experienced twice when I was a teenager. It's, the first time it happens, it's really disturbing because you think, oh my God, am I paralyzed for the rest of my life? Here? Am I going to get buried alive? Or, you know, it's like really cool, my God. And this is a picture of Pian, who is this ghost. And a lot of, not just Thais, but other Asians believe you go into sleep paralysis because a ghost uh, sits on your chest. Right? Apparently it's more common with men. So if you want to avoid it, Steve, what you do is you put lipstick on when you go to bed. Right? <laughs> so they think it's a woman and they, the ghost avoids you. So you've got an excuse now, Ron. Really. Okay? Now, this belief in ghosts really drives Thai consumer behaviour because they don't want to own second hand. Right? Because second hand could have bad juju. Could have been owned by somebody with bad karma who attracted ghosts to the condo and stuff. So new condo good, condo that's been lived in bad. Same with cars, right? They want new, 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 because no bad juju. All right, moving on from that. So looking at other factors that shape Thai culture. Of course, it's until very recently, it was an agricultural culture, right? Very, very agricultural. Uh, and still, it's the biggest, I think, exporter of rice in the world. And I think this is recently changing. And it's the same, going back a couple of hundred years, it was the same in the West and England. Mostly everybody was involved in agriculture. And of course, then there was the Industrial Revolution. People flooded to their factories and cities. So this is one of the results of ag in agricultural societies. You work in the fields, you get deep tans. That makes a premium on pale skin. Pale skin is aristocratic. Pale skin means you're rich. Pale skin means you don't work on a farm. <coughs> Ties love pale skin. It used to be the same in other cultures. <coughs> so unfortunately, Wendy's not here. She asked me this question about, I talked about how uh, during the Vietnam War, women were like bust into, you know, serve, serve the servicemen, as it were, and whether there was a prejudice against them when they went back to the village. And there wasn't really a prejudice against them sleeping with the guys, but of course, condoms weren't so widespread, so there's pregnancies. And I'm like, oh my God, you're going to have a baby that's not purely Thai. doesn't have pure Thai blood. And there was a prejudice again, sorry, there was a prejudice against that until the baby was born. And the baby had pale skin. Pale skin is good, right? So then suddenly that prejudice against uh, having a, a, a mixed child, half, half and half, went away in dynasty. The Thai monarchy has been phenomenal in Thailand. I say, you know, if every monarchy had conducted themselves like the Thai monarchy, there'd be a lot more monarchies still in the world, right? They've been amazing. They've, they've like, they instituted the end of slavery, they instituted democracy, they, um, this guy held the country together because even though they'd be warring between the yellow shirts and the red shirts, they would still wear symbols of loyalty to the king. The king was amazing. And Dr. Mano says this guy's going, you know, has his own style and is doing very well. Going back to King Rama the Sixth. Now, this guy was very interesting, highly educated, spent, uh, went to educational institutions in the Europe, and he decided to change the name of the dynasty to Rama. Because uh, he thought his excuse was it's more digestible to English people. But in actual fact, there was another reason behind it. The Ramagian. Who's, who's heard of the Ramagian? The Ramagian is the second biggest influence in Thailand after Buddhism, in terms of cultural influence. It's from the Ramayana in India. This is a huge, huge, sprawling myth involving a war between demons and humans. 
and the Chakri, the Chakri dynasty, changing the name to Rama, was symbolic of the real uh, dedication they had to this myth. They, in a sense, adopted it as the ruling myth of their family. And it's all about, you know, the royalty that conducts themselves unbelievably honorably. <coughs> Who knows what this is? This is in Chapter 1. Hanuman? 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 Hanuman is an excellent answer, but it's, it's also incorrect. Uh, but it's actually, notice it has a, um, it has a tail. So it's like a mer monkey rather than a monkey. Hanuman is the warrior, the magical the monkey warrior from the Ramagian. But and he was a bit of a jack the lad. And he actually had sex with a mermaid. I assume it was like, you know, bar five and a thousand bar or something. You know. Anyway, uh, and they had a, and the Machinu was a composite of their name. They've actually put up a sign on that junction now that says Machinu, but I wouldn't be getting on a bar bus and saying Jomti and Machinu because I think it's become fairly standardised as Hanuman. And you'll see this symbol elsewhere. This is just down the road, of course. Much ado again, Mermonkey. That's on the top of that building. And the Thai aesthetic for the Ramagian is beautiful. It's much more beautiful than the Indian aesthetic. So we're going to flick through quite a few images here. Look at this amazing mask. These are, of course, the demons. And in classic Thai fashion, they've taken, they have put as temples with these demons from a Hindu myth uh, standing out front and guarding and warding off evil spirits, right? <coughs> this is a really beautiful one in Bangkok. It's beautiful, right? This deep one of the demons. The demons were very individualised. They had their own characters and names. And also it became these beautiful murals. Uh, some of the great works of art were around in Thailand, visual art was around the Ramagian. This is the deep, nasty demon Totsukan getting off with Princess Sita. Again, more murals. This is about the war between demons and humans. Now, Nam Yai. Nam Yai. Nam means high or skin, and Yai is means big. And this was a form of, uh, I don't want to say primitive puppetry, but puppetry that evolved in Thailand, where they would make a, a puppet, as it were, out of a hide of a, 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 a poor sick buffalo. So there's a lot of them up in this arm and stuff. So they would make a, a puppet out of that, and then they'd have a screen behind it with a bonfire behind it, and they'd perform it as like shadow puppetry at night. And we're going to watch a minute and a bit. See if you can guess what this scene is about. Oh, sorry, this is another more advanced, more recent uh, type of Nam Yai. All right, so that's Nam Yai. Now, who, who can give me an opinion about what that scene was about? Anyone? <laughs> Maybe in certain countries. No, it's actually a battle. And you'll see he did this, one time he did this like spinning kick or punch or something. And the victor is symbolized by standing on top of the other person, right? That symbolizes victory in the fight. Now, they would see this many times in the course of their life. And they would already know the plot, but they would rewatch it and rewatch it. Now, Nam Yai, uh, oh, now, when Thais say we're going, I'm going to watch a film, they will still often say, do Nam. Right, go and watch skin, hide, right? 
and that, that expression has kept going. But we do the same thing. Now, I'm thinking of going and watching a film today, but it's no longer celluloid, it's no longer film. It's like digital, right? So, also growing out of the Ramakan was Kaum Theatre. It's a sort of very stylized form of dance. And it's beautiful, again, it's very beautiful. And for a long time, only royalty was allowed to watch this. Right? This is how much they felt possession of this whole myth of, uh, of the, the Ramakin. So we're going to see a, an extract of that. So, you can see it still has that sort of aesthetic origin with the Nam Yai. You know, they, they strike these poses, these set uh, stationary pieces of uh, posture in the course of the battle to indicate who's got uh, dominance over the other person. They'll stand up above them and stuff. Now that, and this still goes on in other visual forms. I'm going to show you a brief. This is beautiful. Have a look at it. เรื่องราวของหลวงพ่อมัสยิดพูดใช้มัสยิดนักเขาไกลหน้าและหน้าทั้งของยูเทนเมื่อชีวิตถูกฝันพอสมัยพูดหลังดับจนสร้างความวุ
I have to be keep my word. See this thing about honourable kings, right? I have to keep my word. Your son will be king. And then she says, but everybody loves Prince Rama. He needs to leave the city for 14 years and go and stay in the forest to, so that because the people will rebel against my son and make him king. And Prince Rama, the king explains it to him. Prince Rama, in all his modesty, goes, all right, I agree that I will stay in the forest for 14 years. Again, see, there's like this modesty, this sort of keeping your word, uh, uh, humbling yourself to the will of the father. So he goes and moves as a peasant. And Princess Sita and, and, one of, and Rama's brother put on peasant clothes and go and live in the forest with him. Enter Samanaka, female demon. She hears this rumor about this guy who's really good looking and like the best looking guy ever. And she thinks, that sounds good. I think I might like him. So she goes and spies on him bathing and goes, me likey, me wanty. And so she transforms herself into this beautiful maiden, pretty hot if you ask me. But then he goes, well, no, I, I'm in love with Princess Sita. She's my, you know, my, my life. So I can't sleep with you. So Samanaka gets really pissed. And she tries to attack and kill Princess Sita. But of course, Rama defends her, defeats the demon Samanaka, and chops her head off, hair off, not head, sorry, just chops her hair off. So she goes sobbing back to Totsukan, king of the demon kingdom, going, ooh, you know, Prince Rama attacked me and chopped my hair off and, and unspeakable things without provocation. So Totsukan gets really shirty. And then she also says, oh, by the way, his wife is like the most beautiful woman ever. And Totsukan is a very jack the lad. And so he thinks, ooh, that sounds good. And so there's this slightly convoluted plot, but then he runs off with he runs off with his Sita, takes him back to the dead <laughs> kingdom. And now it suddenly takes an unrealistic turn because when he gets her back to the demon king kingdom, he doesn't have his way with her straight away because he's advised by the seer Pipek, his wiser brother who's like an astrologer and stuff, not to touch her because bad things will happen astrologically if he does, blah, blah, blah. And so then there's a war against the uh, demons and Hanuman fights for the humans and rescues Cedar and etc. etc. Eventually, the demons win the war. Yes, no, they don't. <laughs> the humans win the war. It's a very big, sprawling epic. Beautiful aesthetic. I, I met the artist who did this. He did a little bit of work for me on something. Now, you can see why this sort of was embraced by and influenced the thought patterns of the, the Chakri dynasty became Rama. That's why the names of Rama. They really admire the example that the people set in this myth, the royalty. Being humble, being true to your word, keeping your promises, you know, all, being obedient to your father. Even after they wanted to come back into the city, Prince Rama says, no, I said I'd stay here for 14 years. I had to fulfill my 14 years in the forest. Now, I'm not an expert on Thai soap operas. But Thai soap operas are different to the West. In the West, we want like days of our life that last like 20, 30, I don't know how many decades, right? But in Thai, they expect uh, a soap opera has a certain sort of time length. And it'll be comparatively short, and it'll come to the end, and, and then they'll reboot it with pretty much the same plot. <laughs> and different actors and different milieu and stuff. And a lot of the sort of characters and plot drivers really come from the Ramagian, you know, the evil woman conspiring, blah, blah, blah. And of course, mostly the actors are cruel, and they're like half away and half time. Some other odd bits and pieces to fill out the time, <laughs> just because I don't think they're worth knowing. You've seen these around, right? These, these roosters at entrance to places, and think, what the hell is a rooster doing standing at the entrance to a bar? Well, you see, in Thailand, roosters are martial animals. Right? Big history of cockfighting. So they're like, like martial animals. So it's like having a symbol of a, a vicious dog or something at, at, to keep away bad spirits and stuff at the front of your place. And of course, these are uh, quite common. They're supposed to bring good luck, phallic symbol, anim animism and stuff. You know, you want your bar to be fruitful, you have that. Also, you can't really you can't have images of Buddha in bars and stuff. 
These, of course, are the Naga, which feature in the Ramakian. And I, I had a friend who did a short documentary, and this woman, it was about Nagas, and this woman said, from our country said, I've seen a Naga three times in my life. And it's not as if they're like biologically impossible. Have a look at this creature. So it could well be that Naga is the most unreal thing. Also, of course, if you go up country, the Thai tradition is richest person pays. Now that's usually always going to be you. So if you go up country, and suddenly you'll you'll find out that the family's much bigger than you thought it was. <laughs> you thought that it was like two sisters, and something that's like, how many people is this person related to? Right, you're expected to pay, not because you're Farang, but because they think you're the richest person. Most Thais can't conceive of being able to even get on an airplane at some stage in their life, more or less fly to another country and live in it. So they assume you're the richest person, and therefore you would want to pay. And don't expect any thank yous, because it's good karma to pay. But I, I was talking to this guy, and he said, oh, you know, I went to one of these big family things, but there were some rich relatives from Bangkok, and they said, no, no, we've got more money than you, we're going to be paying. Right? So stranger things have happened. Right? Chantaburi. Who's been to Chantaburi? It's only a few hours drive east. It's a charming, wonderful place to go. And it means city of the moon. It's a Sanskrit, made from Sanskrit. And this is the symbol of Chantaburi. A rabbit. Who here knows why the symbol of the city of the moon is a rabbit. Anyone? All right. Well, here's the thing. When we look at the moon, we see a man in the moon. We see these big round eyes, right? That's what we see. Thais and Asians don't have round eyes. So they don't see a man in the moon. They see a rabbit in the moon. Next time you go and look at a full moon, Look for the rabbit ears. I was saying this to a Thai lady. I was saying, you know, when we look at the men, we don't we see uh, we don't see a rabbit. We see a, a man in the moon. She said, "How can you not see a rabbit? There's like ears, right?" So this is what they call pareidolia. This is a tendency to see faces and things. And this is a shot from Mars, and people have gone, "Oh, there's a face. Somebody must have constructed a face." But here's the this fascinates me. This really fascinates me. It somewhat freaks me out. Just think about this. There's billions of people on the planet who look at the moon and see a face. Who do not know. There's billions of people who look at the moon and do not see a face, but see a rabbit. Who do not know. There's billions of people on the planet who do not see a rabbit and see a face. That's really freaky. And this is actually really close. It's called what what San Suk or Wang San San Suk. Who's been there besides me? It's a great place to visit. So it's really quite close. You know, it's a really inspiring place. <laughs> it's a picture of Buddhist hell, right? Naraka. The idea is, if your karma gets so bad, you, your soul becomes so heavy, you can't incarnate into human form anymore. So you have to go down to Buddhist version of hell, which is more like purgatory, and suffer, have pain inflicted and commensurate with your sins. This woman has been apparently, I don't know, lying or something. Goodness gracious me, Thailand, who would think? And so she, she is actually, you know, undergoing pain, so, but the demons are doing a good job because by having the pain inflicted on them, then they can resume normal incarnations and hopefully you know, become Buddha, enlightened, and escape the wheel of samsara, of we reincarnation and suffering. So it's, uh, and just kids can wonder in here. So if you want to scare your kids about bad behaviour, say, this is what's going to happen to you. <laughs> it's a fascinating place. And finally, the money tree. Now, if you go to a temple, you don't hand money over to, to a, a monk. And women, in particular, are not supposed to go anywhere near touching a monk. Uh, and what they do is they have this money tree. And they put money in this symbolic tree. Now, where this comes from is in the old days in the villages, monks would make their robes by just collecting 
uh, cloth and old clothing that people had cast off and they died and they'd sew it into robes. But of course the villagers wanted to be more helpful than that. So they would get good cloth and they would hang it out on the, in the trees near the village. And then the monks would find it. It would be like a cloth tree. And over time that evolved into the money tree, as, which you'll see in temples today. And that's all I got for you. So they'll just smile and hope to get some clue about where they fit in together. And I put this slide in specially for... Sorry. Sorry, something's going on. I think you were done. You know, better, you know how I work, Brad. <laughs> what have you done? I am plucking. I'll come back to that point in a second. Okay. Good talk, Brad. I didn't know about the rabbit in the moon, and I did know, know about the proper for time I jumped. Rabbit machine for the moon. Oh, right. Some girl asked for something, and you say that to her. <laughs> but uh, pretty interesting here. Yeah, no, it's fascinating about the moon thing. Uh, going back to Rome's thing. We'll go back. This is not the last slide. What's happening? Okay. Go on. Go on. <coughs> Ren, you said something in the expression about go and look at the skin, um, about looking at the deer hide with the carved figures in it. Yeah, do what not. is the expression in English? And what is in the, do we have an equivalent expression in English? Yeah, do not is what see not film, uh, uh, you know, which is originally hide. We see watch film, right? Even though it's not on film anymore, it's not on cellular, we still see, so watch film, watch a film. I think we're in. Oh, oh, oh we'll come back to that. So, I put this on especially because I was thinking you'd be wrong. What ties love? Because there's this whole thing about hierarchy and they meet someone for the first time, just smile and smile and hope you fit in with them and you know where you are in hierarchy. But ties love clown figures that make them laugh and dissolve all that thing. This is one of the great Thai comic actors. Uh, and very, very popular in Thailand. So something like Big Ron comes on with his big laugh and everybody's my friend and stuff. And they love that because then it dissolves all the issues around uh, social hierarchy, where they are in the hierarchy and stuff. But we've, we've seen ties tend to be a bit less smiley than they used to be. It's becoming a little bit like the land, the land previously known as the land of smiles. And a lot, some of that is just serving the internet and having consumer loans. <laughs> you know. 
It's not the sort of worries they haven't taught in, in the West. Right? Outstanding, Thank, Thanks very much. Um, the thing that's changed most in my village is internet connection. And the phone now is an essential ingredient for the dirt poor and up to whatever echelons. And it's suitable for me because I'm down in Ferrum. So I use a language translator, which I see around here a lot. And all my family stays online. This has been a really huge thing. So my partner calls her family all the time. They exchange photos and videos. They use it as a dating app. Uh, Facebook, they really have an obsession, an obsession with Facebook and selfies. And um, one of the things that's influenced all the entire economy is now internet shopping with Lazada. So that's changed. Not, not just in Thailand, of course, there's all these retail shops in Australia closing for exactly the same reason, is that people might go look at something in the shop and then they'll go online and find out if it's cheaper or something there. Red. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for a very diverse and uh, rich uh, presentation. Um, I liked in particular the linguistic part in the middle. I also enjoyed the Ramayana and traditional stuff at the end. But coming to the World Bank statistics stuff at the beginning, right, which is also, I think, observable by the average person. I mean, the families are smaller. There's an increase in credit and also consumerism. Uh, but I was wondering what your take is regarding the land of smiles point that the other gentleman made. Namely, like, the, the increase in the, the smaller families, the rural urban migration, you know, all the drivers of globalization and commercialism. How has that affected the culture? In other words, is Thailand smiling more, or is Thailand smiling less, or about the same? Uh, I, I have no doubt that Thailand's smiling less than it was, just in my time. And partly that's like the internet. How are you going to smile when it gets down on the phone all the time, right? And you're not engaging people. When you engage people, the smile is a great way to engage people. The way to uh, feel appreciated in Thailand is you must always start with a smile, always start positively and stuff. Um, so it's no doubt in my mind that people are smiling less. And partly that, you know, I talked about Thais having, you know, their language is very much in the now. Well, when you start giving them debt, <laughs> this tends to be more thought about the future, etc. And um, I, I was talking to my friend that, that I mentioned before, and he's had this sister who bought one of these ridiculously large cars, and she made payments for years, but then she couldn't make the last eight payments, and then another sister stepped in and made the last eight payments and ended up owning it. So this gives you a When you're in debt, you really have more worries to, to, to think that you're just not in the moment where you can smile and stuff. So there's a number of, a lot of different factors contributing to that. Hi, Ren. Sorry. Um, I wanted to make a comment about the Thai written language. I don't know, are you familiar with the Fidel chart? The beautiful thing about the Thai written, uh, the written language is that when you see a specific character, that character is always going to have the same sound. Whereas in English, and this is what befuddles so many people trying to speak, learn English, is that, take for example the letter E. You think of all the different pronunciations and different words of how, how that can be used, the same thing with all of our vowels and a lot of the, the, the uh, consonants even. So there's this play thing called the Fidel chart, and this is what really helped me a lot, is that uh, you can actually find it on the internet in, in several languages where they have broken down the character of the language. Uh, the Thai Fidel chart takes one little square, because as I say, when you see a character, it always has the same sound. Whereas the Fidel chart for English, I think, has about 10 or 11 pages because it has to represent each sound of each character. So that's you know one thing that once you get to know it, it, it really helps. And the other thing is that, like you say, the tenses. This is, I think, this is a beautiful thing about Thailand, and it really, again, um, it really messes up people that are trying to learn it. Is all why do we need all those tenses? I mean, if I say I go yesterday, you know what I mean. If I say I go tomorrow, you know what I mean. 
you know, why do we need all these silly, and that's, that's a hard point to get across. Anyway, if there's time afterward, I have one other comment to make about your, the hell, the time hell thing. Um, I'm not sure I totally agree with you. Uh, firstly, I do agree with you that there's a huge, a huge amount of anomalies in any language, especially English, about pronunciation and stuff. But it's also, for instance, Song Prajalun, Long Live the King. The song was, is actually a TR and stuff, right? So there are exceptions. And sometimes consonants at the beginning of the word are pronounced differently to how they're pronounced at the end of the words. Sometimes they don't pronounce the consonant at all at the end of the words because they just trail off. Football is footborn. You know, it's, so it's, it's... This is true, but that chart takes care of all that. Yeah. Even in that little small chart. So there are exceptions, but of course there's a massive number of exceptions in English as well. Judge it Back to families, uh, smaller families, maybe one of the reasons is it's hard to make love when both of the, uh, people are looking at their phones and trying to text. It depends really whether your partner's ugly or not. I mean, you know, if you've got a picture of a sexy woman on your phone or a sexy man, maybe it's easier. I don't know. Hello. 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 I just wanted to, I, I was last month in Bangkok, so I missed your talk, and I wonder if there's something on the internet. Yeah, the talks at the inter on the internet had 250 plus views. We'll put it on the newsletter again. Um, uh, okay, and then I just wanted to make a comment. I did study Sanskrit, and uh, I, um, I didn't go, I didn't go, uh, didn't study all that much, but I was interested in trying to understand some of the text. But, I could tell that uh, there is a lot of connection between English and Sanskrit, I mean, sorry, English and Russian, and Russian and Sanskrit. I didn't see, uh, I mean, they're all three in the European languages. But um, concerning the smiles, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, if a girl smiles at you uh, over there, a pretty girl uh, smiles at you in Russia, that's the time to get a phone number. That's what it means. And they don't smile because the smile could be misinterpreted. So a smile really is a dangerous thing over there in Russia. Yeah, no, no, I, uh, this is what I learned in Russia. It's right. like, it's like uh, it's right. you go from Thailand to say Russia, and all these, and you see the Russians here, they walk all around, around really serious. It's like, I am Russian, I am serious, I am auditioning for KGB. It's like, <laughs> why are these people smiling? And it's like, well, because, you know, it's been proven that if you smile, can't smile, the person's back to you, you feel better, they feel better. No, they are faking you, you just don't breathe. I had a conversation that exactly happened. Um, I wanted to ask about the ghost. It's it's difficult for me to be in a, to get, hear about the ghost. I understand it's their country. I understand all it's the customs things. But for instance, my girlfriend's mother lost someone. She has now moved to a different room in a different house and pays another woman to sleep with her um, simply because of ghosts. Simply because of ghosts. And uh, sometimes I want to say, that's silly. But um, I, anyway, it's, it's just an amazing story. And maybe the rest of us have stories of how far this ghost thing goes. It will change all the behaviors of, of many things that these people do. And uh, I just see it as detrimental. But um, anyway. It's difficult. Yeah, well, the other thing is that Thais grow up, traditionally, but not anymore, uh, in group beds. I, 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 I'm sorry, but this guy was sit, renting out his room that he, he actually, this Thai guy, a studio that he bought to live in. But he said, I can't sleep. I'm sleeping by myself. You know, it's, it's rather crazy. I, my friend who I mentioned before, he's got a, a, kid, a boy who's like 13, and he's still sleeps in the bed with his mother and still wants the mother yeah. to sleep in the bed with him. Right. It's a very tired thing is to sleep in group beds. Uh, I just want to say some supportive thing about the phone. Uh, most ties don't read. <laughs> I know lots of times they don't read. But it's a visual pedagogy, different learning style. So my girlfriend is always on YouTube, Facebook, and stuff like that, and that's how she learns. And, and as you know, I, I say it uh, with my family up there, um, they, they probably have a pretty primary education, uh, but it's opened a big world for them. 
and so it's a very positive thing about technology. Yeah, no, it's a, you know, obviously it's a two-edged sword. I mean, this is now, people say, oh, people don't read as much. They're reading heaps, but they're reading it on their phones and, you know, that, and their computers now. They're just not reading books and stuff. And, that, and the educational, I mean, look how educational YouTube is. And it's actually, in a way, much more natural to learn from visual demonstration on YouTube than to read uh, a set of instructions in a book, which will get you back into talk about, you know, video learning and stuff, right? I just want to go back to uh, the concept of smiling. Uh, a lot of times when you're riding a lot bus here or you're just uh, walking by people, you'll make eye contact with them. And normally, people don't smile when you do that. But I realize that I have the choice to smile at them. And I find that people want to smile here. If I smile at somebody in the States, I might get my face slapped. But, but here, people really do want to smile. I, I've smiled at people and they immediately smile back because they want to smile. I don't think they do on their own because of all the factors you mentioned up front. But uh, smile at people. They'll smile yeah, back. I, I do exactly the same thing. And, it's, and, I, and if they don't smile back, it makes me smile more broadly because I think, wow, I'm so glad I'm not them. <laughs> so it's like, you know, yes, start, start with a smile, right? Uh, feel better whether they smile back or not. Right? I do. And, and people here generally come to Thailand to be friendly, you know. If you want to live in as a social leper and be lonely and stuff, stay in Australia or in America. Or, uh, yes, enjoy the informative talk. I noticed that Salonapum, they have like 12 or 13 of those yacht giants. Is that informative or is that for, you know, to keep bad things from happening at the airport? Uh, I would say, broadly speaking, that's for decoration, really. Because, and it's great that they have those Thai style decorations. Usually, if you're trying to keep bad juju away, you have it at the front of the entrances of bars or houses or whatever it is. So it's not, it's not really about good luck or something. It's more like a decoration uh, reference into Thai culture. And you'll actually see uh, big billboards now where they're trying to stop people using Buddha as a sort of decorative symbol in their homes. So you can all switch to demons and these things. No problem with that. Go on. Hey, Ray, great talk. Uh, one, thing I, one thing I picked up on in your speech I found fascinating was uh, the idea that Thais tend to avoid, uh, they want new homes and new cars because, again, the concern of ghosts. So I'm sure many people in this room own property here, uh, own condos and homes. Is it virtually impossible to sell a lived-in property to a Thai? Or do they, how does that affect the, uh, the real estate market? It does affect the real estate market, but of course they're happy to they're happy to buy it to rent it out to somebody else. So what you'd really want to do is, is see if you get a long-term renter in, and then that would that like and then, then sell it to a time that would make it much more attractive to them and stuff. They're not really worried about owning it; they're worried about living it. <laughs> okay. He doesn't need a mic. We all know. That. You know, about this ghost thing, uh, I've been, uh, what do you call it, uh, picked up for the, uh, being a ghost deal uh, that happened to me. But what's the difference between a ghost thing and they put a, uh, uh, like a curse on you? Is that the same thing? Different, huh? No, no, a curse is a whole different kettle of fish. Okay. They could, they could curse you to have a ghost. Yeah, you have both. <laughs> that explains a lot. Okay, cool. Yeah, usually the curse is in like the West End, they're like, I do. Do you take this woman or this man? But, but the ghost is a Buddha thing, isn't it still? No, no, it's, it, it predates Buddhism and all that sort of thing. It's, uh, Buddhism really isn't that much into ghosts, really. Uh, it's into reincarnation and transcending reincarnation. But obviously there's a soul, but and the, the talk about the bad soul, <laughs> but also the Buddhism is very diverse, right? Very hard. Like I've had monks, senior monks in here, and say, "Can you tell me what Buddhism is in 17 words or less?" And they say, "No." Right? Don't, or don't ask me what Buddhism is. I can't give you a, an answer. Um, I like old houses, and ones that are derelict but look like a good solid structure that'd be great to uh, get and do up. I pointed out a couple recently to my girlfriend, and she says, "Oh no, I couldn't live there. Somebody's probably died in it." And I said, but look at this village. It's 100, 200 years old. People are 
died in every one of these houses, you know, but um, just because that particular house looks like that, that the conclusion is somebody died in it. Well, also, it's a, like a voluntary purchase, whereas in, in the village, you don't have really a choice about where you're going to live, etc. Right? It's like you're making a voluntary purchase. Why would you voluntarily purchase something that somebody could have died in, etc.? And there's various gradations of uh, ghosts. The worst ghosts are uh, uh, women who died in childbirth, right? Because they two two spirits have died at once, so that can be very bad juju. Friend, one of the things that I've noticed is that classic cars are only for foreigners. It's very rare that you see cars with classic cars because it's not new. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. There is a very very big cachet on new. Yeah, can you explain to me um, about this um, second home, second car? I see a lot of it where they put these uh, symbols above the door, particularly on a house, and then they do it on the bonnet of a car. Is that the same reason you were talking about? Yeah, no, it's all to do with this sort of idea of keeping away evil spirits and stuff like that. I wonder if the ties need to become more involved in the idea of purifying energies rather than just trying to ward off bad energies. But yeah, very much like the, they, they tend to have, see cars as a sort of boat that they should like, have stuff on the prow of the boat, the prow of the car and stuff to keep away bad juju. Hi, Ren. Is it, is it possible for any Thai person to put a curse on another, or does the Thai person have to attain a certain status before they would put a curse on? Uh, not really uh, too much over Thai curses and stuff, but I, I would think they're not too fussy about who they might curse and stuff. But generally, I don't think most Thais would think they have the spiritual power to curse someone. They probably want to go to somebody who. Uh, pay someone who has that sort they perceive as having that spiritual power to do it? Yes. Uh, seems like may, maybe uh, one of the reasons that the Thai woman could could uh, convince the Falun to buy a new house or a car is to say, well, I'll have a curse put on you. Uh, yeah, well, as long as you don't say, I do, you're probably not going to experience a really bad curse. Yes, uh, concerning curses, if you want to put a curse on somebody in this country, you go out in the countryside and have somebody capture a monitor lizard for you. And like a, sh a shop or something has cheated you, you take the monitor lizard over to that shop and let it loose in that shop. And you put a big curse on that shop and he has to spend, the owner has to spend a lot of money to bring a bunch of monks in and get rid of the bad spirits. There you go. That's how they do I'm gonna, sorry, curses. I'm going to start up a monitor lizard business. There you go. Thank you for sharing that. We're done. Thank you. Just a little bit of thing. I have a website, helldemons.com. I actually wrote another long story. It's actually uh, the driver of it is whatever happened to the demons from the Ramagian. Well, they've been serving for thousands of years as demons in Narak and Buddhist Tell. Now they come out of Buddhist Tell and they're manipulating the course of mankind, hiding amongst us as demons. It's very easy to believe, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Um, so you might like to go, the beginning of the novel is, uh, is online on that site, so you can read the first section on helldemons.com. Can I help you, Lance? Uh, by the way, there's never going to be a part three. I don't really know that much more. Okay, Ren, another certificate of appreciation to cover up another bank, damp patch on the wall. If you've got damp patches anywhere else, you've got a problem. <laughs>